well, I haven't seen my partner for more than a couple of hours in the last five weeks. <laughs> I haven't seen the kids for much longer than that, but uh, pretty good. Yeah, it's been it's been a very positive couple of years and uh, enjoying it at last. I think so. Yeah, it's um, when we came back from Japan in November 2000, there was a conscious decision to apply some of the ideas that had been kicking around for a while, which was, do you want to work hard or work easy? You know, do you want to live a stressed life or not? Yeah, we, we wanted to we wanted to do all the positive things that were going to help us sustain a happy life, I suppose. And it, it seems to have come out in the music. What we really meant for us, for, for us, us to forget about Underworld and play in live for a while and, and Rick and me just make the music that we wanted to make, that had been the policy on all of the albums. But I think because of the DVD and that being such a such a, a cool document to the band as it was, we didn't have to worry about the kids not knowing what Dad used to do in the old days. We could always stick it on the telly and say that's what it was. So in this instance, it really was a sense of we could walk away from Underworld right now. It, things would get strange, but we could do it if we wanted to. And that pressure coming off enabled us to, to just float around, make the music that we wanted to make. And being, I suppose, a very eclectic group of people, those influences started to creep in. I'm just grateful that there are some tracks on there that seem to be doing the business in the nightclub because that, after all, is the, the route that we started from. It's funny, I, I do subconsciously, although we, we've not been to any clubs for quite some time, but, but yes, subconsciously I do. If, if the music hasn't got a groove, then I'm a bit lost for direction, certainly on stage. It's always a grin when you know that the music is, is still doing it on, on the dance floor. Hmm. That is exactly the kind of thing that a six-year-old would say, yeah. It's Rick's daughter on the way to school um, saying it would be great not to go to school anymore. Or maybe just do a day and then maybe, mm, I don't know, take a hundred days off. Got it. Title. <laughs> Kids come up with the best titles. You know, there, there's always that thing when an uh, artist is trying to find that naivety that they had when they were a kid and certainly when when things are getting too way too focused in the studio the kids being there they'll say stuff they're saying stuff all the time and a rick was coming in telling me things that his daughter had said and and i was clocking things that my kids were saying and they're just they're just amazing stuff we've got drawings up in the studio that the kids have have done probably like most parents do only only we take them quite seriously as record sleeves <laughs> When we were making the record sleeve, or when Tomato was making it, I was quite specific about us getting away from traditional underworld sleeves, whatever they might be. They were generally quite graphic. In this instance, we wanted something that was a little bit more, um, well, a, bit, a little bit more human. Dirk Van Doren at Tomato had done this beautiful series of photographs called Balloon Heads, and there was one in, in particular that really made us smile, and it was a very quick decision. I like it, me too, let's do it then. It was only afterwards people said, hmm, a little bit David Lynch. He went, oh yeah. <laughs> When we started this album, uh, Rick had, uh, apart from saying I'd like two months off, had said, um, why don't you bring your record collection in? Something that Darren used to do in the early days, probably something that we hadn't done to that extent for years. So I've, I've got a very a wide ranging taste in records and uh, I brought them into the studio and it turned out that most of them were really sort of indigenous music from around the world, something I'm, I'm quite obsessive about. We listened to those things and um, to a large extent Rick got off on the quality of the recordings and, and the vibe within the music and that probably seeped in and inspired us to go out and buy a lot of percussion and start playing live percussion on the album and then he cut them up, looped them, moved them around and a lot of people have, have taken note of the fact that we seem to have a, have a kind of more of a world influence than a specifically urban club influence. Oh, there's a great shop in London called Ray Man, and uh, we, we, we've known it for years, and, and they seem to like us an awful lot now, since we backed our lorry up to the back door and bought half the shop. Really strange instruments. When you look across the room and you'd see a coconut on a piece of string with a stone, and you go, oh, what does that do? Oh, take that, and what do, that, what do those teeth do? And what does that bit of tin with an old elephant attached to it sound like? So we've got quite a menagerie of things back home. Um, just stuff that sounded very different from the electronics that we've got. Uh, Rick and I like to like to mix up live sounds with uh, electronic sounds. When you're locked away in the studio, it's nice to go out on a shopping spree and buy weird and wonderful things that are going to inspire you to, to play in ways that uh, you've never tried before. Dinosaur Adventure. Now, this started off as a, a riff that I, that I wrote. Rick took on, started working on rhythm ideas and then suggested we jam on it 
get in there with the percussion. He started cutting it up. This this process went on for months, really. Eventually got me in to sing on it. First attempt was rubbish, which he pointed out to me in no uncertain <laughs> manner, <laughs> which I can take. That's okay. I'm old and big now. And then so he, his solution was for me to not listen to my singing, but to listen to something else while I was singing, which produced this uh, sort of style of singing I, I don't think I've done before. Uh-huh. Juanita um, started off as um, receptionist at Tomato and has worked her way up to one of the people that seem to be running the show these days. <laughs> She's recorded her voice for us many times in the past, as have a lot of our friends, and very few of them make it to the record. Um, in this instance, she's made it to record twice. And what's interesting is that if you look back through all our albums, you'll hear friends' voices speaking my words. Um, on this one, I think because... There's such a space has been cleared around her voice. The assumption is that she's a she's a vocalist on the track. I get asked that quite a lot. But there she is. She's back there running the ship of Tomato still. <laughs> and I really hope she doesn't become a vocalist. My lyrics um, haven't changed in their location from, from any other album. I'm still interested in the urban condition. I'm still interested in my my journeys through. Um, the urban environment, um, the details that I pick up along the way, tiny little snippets of the city, and those become the the basis of the songs. But what I suppose has changed is that I stopped trawling the twilight zone and, and, and focused on, on the daylight hours, consequently cities that really I was burnt out on in the past have, uh, have opened up to me again. You know, London, New York, that I've written about many, many times. They're just sort of, they've become really fresh to me again. The kind of conversations that I'm focusing on and the sort of details that, that I'm drawn to are 180 degrees in the opposite direction. I see a lot of sunshine in this record. I do. Even even the tracks that will obviously make it to the club, I see I see a lot of light. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Funnily enough, boys and girls, I see a lot of light on the head. Musically, for, for I don't know what it was like for Rick, but for me, I, I just wanted us to make another album which put to rest any speculation as to who did what over the albums in the past. Um, for myself, I'd seen Rick not getting as much uh, recognition for the vast amount of work that he was putting into the record. And f again, this was a personal thing. I wanted to see this album reflect the fact that nothing had changed. And so underlining uh, Rick's talent as a, as a producer and as a writer. And as a two-piece now, it's, um, it's easier. It is a lot easier. I mean, Rick and I are now together for 22 years, and, uh, and there's, a, there's, a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of things that we can, we can dispense with and because we've known each other for that long. As I say, we, can, we know when we've got out of bed on the wrong side and things, things don't go very deep with us. If we're having a bad day, we can have a disagreement and it's gone. We can deal with things or if we can't deal with things, we'll come back to them tomorrow and we'll deal with them. It is, I suppose it, it is a bit like a marriage in the sense that you kind of go, look, this, is, this could well be forever. So let's just deal with all of that and get on to the good stuff. Um, Darren left, I think, in the winter of 99. Um, and we didn't hear from him again. So for me, it's a case of like giving your mate the space that he obviously needs, and, and then one day we'll bump into each other and go, what a laugh, eh? I'm looking forward to being out on stage. I'm looking forward to being out on stage an awful lot because it's such an immediate process. I enjoy making music. I enjoy what happens when Rick drops a, a great groove, something happens in my blood, and I animate, and, and I like that feeling. I think I've... I haven't animated enough for too long now. It's it's mad. It's mad. It really is mad. One of the most extraordinary things about playing to a Japanese audience is that they, they can be as enthusiastic and as wild as, as anywhere in the world, but they have this capacity to stop screaming, applauding, responding en masse as one. So last time we played there was probably the audience of about 20,000 would scream, cry, shout, stamp, whatever, wave their arms in the air and then suddenly stop. So in Japan, if you're in the audience, you'll, you'll suddenly hear Rick and I caught out <laughs> shouting to one another <laughs> in the middle of it all. It's, uh, it's not very cool. Best moment on the tour. It's difficult to single out anyone, but if I had to, it would be the very first show that we did at the Astoria in London. 
uh, where Rick and I, although we knew that that musically we could play as a two piece, that wasn't a problem. It was how the fans were going to respond. Were they going to be angry? Were they going to be upset? Were they going to use that, you know, to vent their frustration at the fact that there was that there was no longer three of us on stage? And so there were some trepidations we went out there as to how people would react to us. And before we even started playing, and and I've spoken to people since that have said that they were there that night before we came on stage. Something very special was in the air and uh, you came on stage and you saw people's faces and instantly you knew that they were all saying it's going to be all right it's really going to be all right now can we please do some dancing and uh, that I suppose is probably go down as one of the most memorable gigs ever Lots of sweat, lots of energy I hope, I hope these legs can still cut it We've got a new production um, which does make me smile <laughs> I've got to say and uh, images inspired by things that I've done on the internet that Rick and I have carried on um, same crew which I'm really looking forward to going back out again I mean some of the guys that we've been with for about 15 16 years now and you just know you hand over your life to them and it and it comes back in one piece yeah we everything that we're doing is still live no tapes very little rehearsal even less rehearsal than we've ever done before uh, improvising making it up as we go along ricky calling the first tune as we as we walk up onto stage and responding to the crowd so like uh, as as any good dj does uh, responding to the crowd and, and making it up depending on their vibe i suppose it has in a way although Without dance music, I think we would have continued to drift around without, without a route. And uh, dance music has given us a home that we can say that's the, that's the basic start of the group. And certainly for live, without that thing that dance music brings, you know, that sort of joyous celebration of physical madness, going out live would be a very different experience for me. What's happening is that we're uh, we're doing festivals throughout the summer, and we're doing the doing the Creamfield festivals. We're doing festivals over in Europe, all of which seem to be dance festivals, which is fantastic, because having uh, come back off a, off a tour where we're doing our own shows, it's really good to kind of go back to that route again of playing to a, a purely dance audience. They're kind of tougher, you know. They sort of expect stuff, or maybe that's just us putting preconceptions into it. But I like that. I like playing to a, a dance audience every so often. Then our tour proper begins. We start in America, go to Japan, and then come to the UK in November. Well, that was lovely, and I'd just like to say thank you very much. You made it very, very easy for me.